This is the gentleman from Florida, Mr. DeSantis, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to the witnesses. I appreciate um, everyone's testimony. I, I've had heard, just as we've gotten into this from some of my colleagues on the other side, that Congress just cannot handle an impeachment, take a year and all this. This is a one-day case. We we'll present the case in one day. Uh, the facts are really the facts. There are subpoenas issued. The tapes were destroyed. The emails were destroyed. There were statements made that are demonstrably false. There was a lack of effort on the IRS to even look for in obvious places. So either you're good with that or you're not. Uh, so I think that this idea this is going to take, it's like climbing Mount Everest to simply put on this case, is just not true. We absolutely could do it, and I think we need to do it. Uh, high crimes and misdemeanors. Um, in your book, Mr. McCarthy, you talked about some of the historical understandings uh, of this. And when the framers were devising the high crimes and misdemeanors provision, the biggest example was the uh, India, the governor of India who had been impeached, uh, Hastings. Right. And um, they specifically looked at whether you needed criminal intent. And I know in the debates they said, well, no, you can't say you can only have treason or crime because Hastings was not necessarily guilty of that. He was more guilty of breaching his duties that he owed to the, the crown, correct? Yeah, I, I think it's very clear that a criminal offense is not required. I also think it's worth pointing out that the Constitution explicitly provides that somebody who has been impeached is still subject to trial. So the framers obviously understood that this was not the analog of a criminal proceeding, because if it were, you would raise profound double jeopardy questions if you were to prosecute somebody afterwards. It's pretty clear from the way the Constitution is laid out and from the arguments that were made at the time that it was adopted that this is not required to be any a criminal trial in the procedural sense, and it doesn't call for a criminal offense in the substantive sense. And I like your uh, reference in the Obama Navy guy. So um, dereliction of duty and conduct unbecoming an officer and a gentleman. Those are actionable offenses under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Now, those are criminal under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. They would not be considered criminal necessarily, those acts in civilian society. But that provides an interesting analog that if you are just so grossly negligent, you're not doing any of your duties, that there's a mechanism to be able to hold you accountable. So you agree that if somebody is just grossly negligent, if their conduct is just simply not becoming an officer, that that could potentially be actionable for an impeachment? I, I think it could potentially be, uh, but I also think there, there, the ingredients involved here are the nature of the wrong, how much does it threaten our constitutional framework, the culpability of the actor, and the necessity that Congress check the executive branch. And I think the difficulty in, in fixing apodictically on a standard is that that's situational. It's, it, it will be different from instance to instance. And we sometimes will hear, well, Congress hasn't done this in a long time. Uh, would you agree that right now Congress's power is really at its historical nadir in terms of how the founders uh, conceived of the legislative branch? Yeah, I, I think Madison thought impeachment was indispensable. The framers expected it would be used more than it has been. And perhaps the reason that Congress is at this low ebb is precisely because it hasn't been used when it should have been. Or use the power of the purse. I mean, there are certain right. tools that, that Congress has, and they've, they've given a lot of power to the bureaucracy over the years. So here we are, and I appreciated Professor Turley. We send a subpoena, and it's like nobody even cares about it. Uh, th they didn't need to follow any of this stuff. They made a decision that going in that direction, there would be no consequences, the contempt, no consequences. And I just think if we keep allowing that, I think that we're inviting the executive branch to continue to trample over Congress's powers. I think in this case, clearly, uh, this is an example of checking the executive branch because the underlying conduct was very serious. It struck at the heart of who we are as a country and our freedoms. And wh whatever you think of that, because I know there'll be disagreements on the other side, Clearly, Congress had the right to get this information and to conduct proper oversight over the executive branch. And this commissioner, under his tutelage, the agency has thwarted our efforts at every step of the way. I shudder to think what would happen to a taxpayer, a business owner who was audited. The IRS issues a summons for documents, and the response two months later is, well, we destroyed the documents, sorry. The IRS would not accept that. Uh, you would face consequences. Indeed, that's the, one of the cardinal sins with tax compliance is to simply destroy documents that were under subpoena or under a summons. And so uh, I'm glad we're having this hearing. I appreciate the range of views, and I yield back the balance of my time.